In this unit, we're going to learn how to solve a particular type of differential equation. To this point, the only kinds of differential equations we know how to actually solve are ones that we can solve by integration. Ones where we have y prime equals just a function of x or t and not any y values. Now we're going to learn about a new class of differential equations that we can also solve. Again, there are a variety of differential equations we won't learn how to solve, and there are many that we can't solve by hand anyway, but this type of differential equation is one that we will be able to solve, and it's a type of first order equation. And the fact that it's separable has to do with the structure of it, and it means that we can do some algebra and separate out variables. Let me show you an example to see how this works. Here's an example of a separable differential equation. It's a first order equation and it's set up where we have y prime equals x squared over y squared. We can't solve this one simply by integration directly because there are not only x's on the right side but also y's. But it turns out that we can separate these variables. There's algebra we can do to separate the x's from the y's. And specifically when I say separate them, I mean to move all of one variable to one side and all of the other variable to the other side. So we'll separate this and have the x's on one side of the equation and the y's on the other side. First, we're going to rewrite y prime as dy over dx. This is important just from a notational standpoint, and you'll see why in just a second. Now, the next step is the idea of separation. And it looks mostly like an algebraic step that you're used to. We have to be a little bit careful dealing with differentials like dy and dx. So in a later video, I'll show you a little bit more rigorous explanation of why this works. But for now, you can think of it this way. You can think of multiplying the y squared onto the left side and multiplying the dx onto the right side. Now, why do we do that? When we do that, we end up with y squared dy equals x squared dx. Again, dealing with differentials, you can't quite just multiply like this, but notationally it works, and again later on we'll see a little bit more rigorous explanation for why it works the way it does. For now you can think of dx as something you can multiply on both sides of the equation. At this point, we can integrate both sides, and notice that we have an integral with respect to y on the left side, an integral with respect to x on the right side, and both of those are integrals that we can easily handle. When we do, we get one-third y cubed on the left side, and one-third x cubed plus c on the right side. Notice I only put plus c on the right side. I could have put plus c on both sides, but of course we can combine all the arbitrary constants on one side of the equation. So it's most convenient just to put it on the right side there with the x's. And then remember that our goal with any differential equation like this is to find the function y that satisfies this differential equation. So we want to solve for y if at all possible. In this case we can solve for y by multiplying by 3. And at this point if you want to, you could instead of writing 3c, you could just write something like k because 3 times an arbitrary constant is still just an arbitrary constant. There's no reason really to keep the 3 on it. It doesn't change much. And then we can do one more step, taking the cube root of both sides. Like this. And so we could write our answer this way, or we could write y equals x cubed plus k, or we could use 3c if we wanted to, to the 1 -third power. You might see it written one way or the other, and of course both are equivalent. So that's our general solution to this differential equation. And if you wanted to, you could check that that is a solution, like we've done before. You could plug it into this differential equation, find y prime, and then find y squared, and substitute those in, and make sure that both sides of the equation come out equal. The algebra is a little bit messy on this one, so we won't go through and show that. 
but you can, in general, check your answers this way. And it's a handy tool when you finish a problem to know that you can check your solution. Just like when we integrated, we could always check our answers by differentiating. Now, of course, once we have a general solution, we can also find a specific solution. And for that, we would need an initial condition. Let's say we're given the initial condition that y of 0 equals 2. We can plug in 0 for x and 2 for y. And we would get that 2 equals the cube root of k. So of course, when you cube both sides, k equals 8. So y equals the cube root of x cubed plus 8. That would be a specific solution given that initial condition. That part is relatively familiar. We've done that several times before. So in general, if we look back over this problem, the process is if a differential equation happens to be separable, it's going to be first order, and it has to fit this form where we can do a little algebra to separate the variables, and we'll always put all the y's on the left side with dy, and then all the x's on the right side with dx. And of course the reason for that is that we want dy and dx to both be in the numerator on the appropriate side. So it has to be one that you can do this algebra process to. And so it takes a little bit of algebra skill to recognize a separable equation. This one, once you get used to doing them, is pretty clearly separable, but there are ones that might be a little bit tricky, where you have to do a little bit of algebra to factor things and so on to separate the x's from the y's. But in general, if they can be separated like that, then this process will work. Let me show you the general form of this. So in general, a separable equation will look like dy over dx equals some function of x times some function of y. In our example, we had dy dx equals x squared over y squared, which we could write as x squared times 1 over y squared. So as long as it can be written in that form, it's separable. For example, if we had dy dx equals secant of y times cosine of x, that's pretty clearly a product of a function of x and a function of y separated out. So since they're separate and multiplied together, we can divide the function of y to the other side and separate them in that way. So that is separable. How about one like dy dx equals 2x plus xy over y squared plus 1? That certainly doesn't look separable at first. It looks like we're adding together pieces with x and y, and so it doesn't appear to be separable. However, if you notice carefully, there's an x factor in the numerator that can be factored out. And when we do, we get all of that. And you can separate this as a function of x times a function of y. So sometimes you may need to do a little bit of algebra to find the separation, but if it's separable, it can always be written as a function of x times a function of y. Here's an example of one that is not separable. 1 plus x times y. That one is not separable because, try as you might, there's no way to write that as strictly a function of x times a function of y. Or if we had something like x plus y. That again cannot be written as a function of x times a function of y. So it's important at the beginning to be able to recognize separable equations and ones that are not separable. We will learn after this one other method for dealing with first order equations. So on the homework or test, at least in this class, when you see a first order equation, you'll automatically know it's either separable or that other form, and you can distinguish between the two and figure out which one applies. But for now, if we can find that it's separable, if we can 
write it as a function of x times a function of y. Then the next step, as we showed in that example, is to divide both sides by that function of y. So we would have 1 over g of y dy equals f of x dx. And then we can integrate both sides. And this is the general formulation of it. You can look at the example we just did and see how it plays out in practice. So as long as you can integrate both of those functions, then you can solve this equation. And then at the end, I'll say, if possible, solve for y. There are examples you'll find where that last step of solving for y just isn't doable algebraically. And then we can leave the answer with a function of y on the left side and a function of x on the right side, and that's okay. But if possible, try to solve for y as much as you can.